Ulysses, 15, C, the third of seven parts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, 15, C. Bloom explains to those near him his schemes for social regeneration. All agree with him. The keeper of the Kildare Street Museum appears, dragging a lorry, on which are the shaking statues of several naked goddesses. Venus Calipyge, Venus Pendemos, Venus Metempsychosis, and plaster figures, also naked, representing the new nine muses, commerce, operatic music, amour, publicity, manufacture, liberty of speech, plural voting, gastronomy, private hygiene, seaside concert entertainments, painless obstetrics, and astronomy for the people. Father Farley he is an Episcopalian, an agnostic, an anything Arian, seeking to overthrow our holy faith. Mrs. Riordan tears up her will. I'm disappointed in you, you bad man. Mother Grogan removes her boot to throw it at Bloom. You beast, you abominable person. Nosy Flynn. Give us a tune, Bloom. One of the old sweet songs. Bloom, with rollicking humor. I vowed that I never would leave her. She turned out a cruel deceiver with my toodaloom, 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 toodaloom. Hoppy Hollihan. Good old Bloom. There's nobody like him after all. Paddy Leonard, stage Irishman. Bloom, what railway opera is like a tram line in Gibraltar? The Rose of Castile. Laughter. Lenahan, plagiarist. Down with Bloom. The veiled Sibyl, enthusiastically. I'm a Bloomite, and I glory in it. I believe in him in spite of all. I'd give my life for him, the funniest man on earth. Bloom winks at the bystanders. I bet she's a bonny lassie. Theodore Purefoy, in fishing cap and oilskin jacket. He employs a mechanical device to frustrate the sacred ends of nature. The veiled Sibyl stabs herself. My hero god, she dies. Many most attractive and enthusiastic women also commit suicide by stabbing, drowning, drinking prussic acid, aconite, arsenic, opening their veins, refusing food, casting themselves under steam rollers from the top of Nelson's pillar into the great vat of Guinness's brewery, asphyxiating themselves by placing their heads in gas ovens, hanging themselves in stylish garters, leaping from windows of different stories. Alexander J. Dowie, violently. Fellow Christians and anti-bloomites, the man called Bloom is from the roots of hell. A disgrace to Christian men, a fiendish libertine from his earliest years, this stinking goat of Mendes, gave precocious signs of infantile debauchery, recalling the cities of the plain with a dissolute grandam. This vile hypocrite, bronzed with infamy, is the white bull mentioned in the apocalypse a worshipper of the scarlet woman intrigue is the very breath of his nostrils the steak faggots and the cauldron of boiling oil are for him caliban the mob lynch him roast him 
He's as bad as Parnell was, Mr. Fox. Mother Grogan throws her boot at Bloom. Several shopkeepers from Upper and Lower Dorset Street throw objects of little or no commercial value, ham-bones, condensed milk-tins, unsaleable cabbage, stale bread, sheep's tails, odd pieces of fat. Bloom excitedly. This is midsummer madness, some ghastly joke again, by heaven. I am guiltless as the unsunned snow. It was my brother, Henry. He is my double. He lives in number two Dolphin's barn. Slander, the viper, has wrongfully accused me. Fellow countrymen, Skenlin ban bata koiste gan kapal. I call on my old friend Dr. Malachi Mulligan, sex specialist, to give medical testimony on my behalf. Dr. Mulligan, in motor jerkin, green motor goggles on his brow. Dr. Bloom is bisexually abnormal. He has recently escaped from Dr. Eustace's private asylum for demented gentlemen. Born out of bedlock, hereditary epilepsy is present, the consequence of unbridled lust. Traces of elephantiasis have been discovered among his ascendants. There are marked symptoms of chronic exhibitionism. Ambidexterity is also latent. He is prematurely bald from self-abuse perversely idealistic in consequence, a reformed rake, and has metal teeth. In consequence of a family complex, he has temporarily lost his memory, and I believe him to be more sinned against than sinning. I have made a pre-vaginal examination, and after application of the acid test to 5,427 anal, axillary, pectoral, and pubic hairs, I declare him to be Virgo intacta. Bloom holds his high-grade hat over his genital organs. Dr. Madden. Hypsus patty is also marked. In the interest of coming generations, I suggest that the parts affected should be preserved in spirits of wine in the National Teratological Museum. Dr. Crothers. I have examined the patient's urine. It is albuminoid. Salivation is insufficient. The patella reflex intermittent. Dr. Punch Costello. The fetor judaicus is most perceptible. Dr. Dixon reads a bill of health. Professor Bloom is a finished example of the new womanly man. His moral nature is simple and lovable. Many have found him a dear man, a dear person. He is a rather quaint fellow, on the whole, coy, though not feeble-minded in the medical sense. He has written a really beautiful letter, a poem in itself, to the court missionary of the Reformed Priests Protection Society, which clears up everything. He is practically a total abstainer, and I can affirm that he sleeps on a straw litter and eats the most Spartan food, cold, dried grocer's peas. He wears a hair shirt of pure Irish manufacture, winter and summer, and scourges himself every Saturday. He was, I understand, at one time a first-class misdemeanant in Glencree Reformatory. Another report states that he was a very posthumous child. I appeal for clemency in the name of the most sacred word our vocal organs have ever been called upon to speak. He is about to have a baby. General commotion and compassion. Women faint. A wealthy American makes a street collection for Bloom. Gold and silver coins, blank checks, bank notes, jewels, treasury bonds, maturing bills of exchange, IOUs, wedding rings, watch chains, lockets, necklaces and bracelets, are rapidly collected. Bloom. Oh, I so want to be a mother. Mrs. Thornton, in nurse tender's gown. Embrace me tight, dear. You'll be soon over it. Tight, dear. Bloom embraces her tightly and bears eight male, yellow and white, children. 
They appear on a red-carpeted staircase adorned with expensive plants. All the octuplets are handsome, with valuable metallic faces, well-made, respectably dressed and well-conducted, speaking five modern languages fluently, and interested in various arts and sciences. Each has his name printed in legible letters on his shirt-front. Nasodoro, Goldfinger, Chrysostomos, Main Dori, Silver Smile, Silber Selber, Vifargent, Panarjaros. They are immediately appointed to positions of high public trust in several different countries as managing directors of banks, traffic managers of railways, chairman of limited liability companies, vice chairman of hotel syndicates. A voice. Bloom, are you the Messiah Ben Joseph or Ben David? Bloom, darkly. You have said it. Brother Buzz. Then perform a miracle like uh, Father Charles. Bantam Lyons. Prophesy who will win the Saint Leger. Bloom walks on a net, covers his left eye with his left ear, passes through several walls, climbs Nelson's pillar, hangs from the top ledge by his eyelids, eats twelve dozen oysters, shells included, heals several sufferers from king's evil, contracts his face so as to resemble many historical personages, Lord Beaconsfield, Lord Byron, Watt Tyler, Moses of Egypt, Moses Maimonides, Moses Mendelssohn, Henry Irving, Rip Van Winkle, Kossuth, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Baron Leopold Rothschild, Robinson Crusoe, Sherlock Holmes, Pasteur, turns each foot simultaneously in different directions, bids the tide turn back, eclipses the sun by extending his little finger. Brini, Papal Nuncio, in Papal Zouave's uniform, steel cuirasses as breastplate, arm plates, thigh plates, leg plates, large profane moustaches, and brown paper mitre. Leopoldi autem generatio. Moses begat Noah, and Noah begat Eunuch, and Eunuch begat O'Halloran, and O'Halloran begat Guggenheim, and Guggenheim begat Agendath, and Agendath begat Nataim, and Nataim begat Lahersh, and Lahersh begat Jesurum, and Jesurum begat Mackay, and Mackay begat Ostrolopsky and Ostrolopsky begat Smerdols, and Smerdols begat Weiss, and Weiss begat Schwarz, and Schwarz begat Adrianopoli, and Adrianopoli begat Arandres, and Arandres begat Louis Lawson, and Louis Lawson begat Ikebudonosor, and Ikebudonosor begat O'Donnell Magnus, and O'Donnell Magnus begat Christbaum, and Christbaum begat Ben Maimun, and Ben Maimun begat Dusty Rhodes, and Dusty Rhodes begat Ben Amor, and Ben Amor begat Joan Smith, and Joan Smith begat Zavorgnanovich, and Zavorgnanovich begat Jasperstone, and Jasperstone begat Vingtetuniemi, and Vingtetuniemi begat Zombathli, and Zombathli begat Virag, and Virag begat Bloom. Et vocabitur nomen Ius Emmanuel. A dead hand writes on the wall. Bloom is a cod. Crab in Bushranger's kit. What did you do in the cattle creek behind Kilbarak? A female infant shakes a rattle. And under Ballybow Bridge. A holly bush. And in the Devil's Glen. Bloom blushes furiously all over from Franz to Nate's three tears falling from his left eye. Spare my past. The Irish evicted tenants, in body-coats, knee-breeches, with Donnybrook fair shillelaghs. Zjambok him. Bloom, with ass's ears, seats himself in the pillory with crossed arms, his feet protruding. He whistles Don Giovanni, a senar teco. Artane orphans joining hands caper round him. Girls of the prison gate mission joining hands caper round in the opposite direction. 
The Artane Orphans You hig, you hog, you dirty dog, you think the ladies love you. The Prison Gate Girls If you see K, tell him he may see you in T, tell him from me. Hornblower, in ephod and hunting cap, announces, And he shall carry the sins of the people to Azazel, the spirit which is in the wilderness, and to Lilith, the night hag, and they shall stone him and defile him, yea, all from Agendath, Nataim, and from Mizraim, the land of Ham. All the people cast soft pantomime stones at Bloom. Many bona fide travellers and ownerless dogs come near him and defile him. Mastiansky and Citron approach in gabardines wearing long earlocks. They wag their beards at Bloom. Mastiansky and Citron Belial, lame line of Istria, the false messiah. Abulafia, recant. George R. Messias, Bloom's tailor, appears, a tailor's goose under his arm, presenting a bill. Messias. To alteration, one pair trousers, eleven shillings. Bloom rubs his hands cheerfully. Just like old times. Poor Bloom. Reuben J. Dodd, black-bearded Iscariot, bad shepherd, bearing on his shoulders the drowned corpse of his son, approaches the pillory. Reuben J. whispers hoarsely, The squeak is out. A split is gone for the flatties. Nip the first rattler. The fire brigade. Plop! Brother Buzz invests Bloom in a yellow habit with embroidery of painted flames and high-pointed hat. He places a bag of gunpowder round his neck and hands him over to the civil power, saying, Forgive him his trespasses. Lieutenant Myers of the Dublin Fire Brigade, by general request, sets fire to Bloom. Lamentations. The Citizen. Thank heaven. Bloom, in a seamless garment marked I.H.S., stands upright amid phoenix flames. Weep not for me, O daughters of Erin. He exhibits to Dublin reporters traces of burning. The daughters of Erin, in black garments, with large prayer books and long lighted candles in their hands, kneel down and pray. Daughters of Erin. Kidney of Bloom, pray for us. Flower of the Bath, pray for us. Mentor of Menton, pray for us. Canvasser for the Freeman, pray for us. Charitable Mason, pray for us. Wandering Soap, pray for us. Sweets of Sin, pray for us. Music without words, pray for us. Reprover of the Citizen, pray for us. Friends of all Frillies, pray for us. Midwife Most Merciful, pray for us. Potato Preservative against Plague and Pestilence, pray for us. A choir of six hundred voices, conducted by Vincent O'Brien, sings the chorus from Handel's Messiah, Alleluia, for the Lord God Omnipotent reigneth, accompanied on the organ by Joseph Glynn. Bloom becomes mute, shrunken, carbonized. Zoe. Talk away till you're black in the face. Bloom, in cawbean with clay pipe stuck in the band, dusty brogues, an immigrant's red handkerchief bundle in his hand, leading a black bog-oak pig by Sugon, with a smile in his eye. Let me be going now, woman of the house, for by all the goats in Connemara, I am after having the father and mother of a baiting. With a tear in his eye, all insanity, patriotism, sorrow for the dead, music, future of the race, to be or not to be, Life's dream is o'er. End it peacefully. They can live on. He gazes far away mournfully. I am ruined. A few pastilles of aconite. The blinds drawn. A letter. Then lie back to rest. He breathes softly. No more. I have lived. Fair. Farewell. Zoe. Stiffly, her finger in her neck fillet. Honest? 
till the next time, she sneers. Suppose you got up the wrong side of the bed, or came too quick with your best girl. Oh, I can read your thoughts. Bloom, bitterly. Man and woman, love, what is it? A cork and bottle. I'm sick of it. Let everything rip. Zoe, in sudden sulks. I hate a rod if it's insincere. Give a bleeding whore a chance. Bloom, repentantly. I am very disagreeable. You are a necessary evil. Where are you from? London? Zoe, glibly. Hogs Norton, where the pigs play the organs. I'm Yorkshire-born. She holds his hand, which is feeling for her nipple. I say, Tommy Tittlemouse, stop that and begin worse. <laughs> Have you cash? For a short time? Ten shillings? Bloom smiles, nods slowly. More hourly, more. Zoe. And more's mother. She pats him off-handedly with velvet paws. Are you coming into the music room to see our new pianola? Come, and I'll peel off. Bloom, feeling his occiput dubiously with the unparalleled embarrassment of a harassed peddler gauging the symmetry of her peeled pears. Somebody would be dreadfully jealous if she knew the green-eyed monster. Earnestly. You know how difficult it is. I needn't tell you. Zoe, flattered. What the eye can't see, the heart can't grieve for. She pats him. Come. Bloom, laughing witch, the hand that rocks the cradle. Zoe, babby. Bloom, in baby linen and police, big-headed with a call of dark hair, fixes big eyes on her fluid slip and counts its bronze buckles with a chubby finger, his moist tongue lolling and lisping. One, two, three, three, two, clone. The buckles. Love me, love me not. Love me. Zoe. Silent means consent. With little parted talons, she captures his hand, her forefinger giving to his palm the past touch of secret monitor, luring him to doom. Hot hands, cold gizzard. He hesitates amid scents, music, temptations. She leads him towards the steps drawing him by the odor of her armpits, the vice of her painted eyes, the rustle of her slip in whose sinuous folds lurks the lion reek of all the male brutes that have possessed her. The male brutes, exhaling sulphur of rut and dung and ramping in their loose box, faintly roaring, their drugged heads swaying to and fro. Good! Zoe and Bloom reach the door where two sister whores are seated. They examine him curiously from under their penciled brows and smile to his hasty bow. He trips awkwardly. Zoe, her lucky hand instantly saving him. whoops -a, Don't fall upstairs. Bloom. The just man falls seven times. He stands aside at the threshold. After you is good manners. Zoe. Ladies first, gentlemen after. She crosses the threshold. He hesitates. She turns and, holding out her hands, draws him over. He hops. On the antlered rack of the hall hang a man's hat and waterproof. Bloom uncovers himself, but, seeing them, frowns, then smiles, preoccupied. A door on the return landing is flung open. A man in purple shirt and gray trousers, brown-socked, passes with an ape's gait, his bald head and goatee beard upheld, hugging a full water-jug jar, his two-tailed black braces dangling at heels. Averting his face quickly, Bloom bends to examine on the hall table the spaniel eyes of a running fox. Then his lifted head sniffing follows Zoe into the music room. A shade of mauve tissue paper dims the light of the chandelier. Round and round a moth flies, colliding, escaping. The floor is covered with an oilcloth mosaic of jade and azure and cinnabar rhomboids. Footmarks are stamped over it in all senses, heel to heel, heel to hollow, toe to toe, feet locked, a morris of shuffling feet without body phantoms. All in a scrimmage higgledy-piggledy. 
The walls are tapestried with paper of yew fronds and clear glades. In the grate is spread a screen of peacock feathers. Lynch squats cross-legged on the hearth of matted hair, his cap back to the front. With a wand he beats time slowly. Kitty Ricketts, a bony, pallid whore in navy costume, doe-skin gloves rolled back from a coral wristlet, a chain purse in her hand, sits perched on the end of the table, swinging her leg and glancing at herself in the gilt mirror over the mantelpiece. A tag of her corslet lace hangs slightly below her jacket. Lynch indicates mockingly the couple at the piano. Kitty coughs behind her hand. She is a bit imbecilic. She signs with the wagging forefinger. Blem, blem. Lynch lifts up her skirt and white petticoat with his wand. She settles them down quickly. Respect yourself. <clears throat> she hiccups, then bends quickly her sailor hat, under which her hair glows red with henna. Oh, excuse. Zoe. More limelight, Charlie. She goes to the chandelier and turns the gas full cock. Kitty peers at the gas jet. What ails it tonight? Lynch deeply. Enter a ghost and hobgoblins. Zoe. Clap on the back for Zoe. The wand in Lynch's hand flashes a brass poker. Stephen stands at the pianola on which sprawl his hat and ash plant. With two fingers he repeats once more the series of empty fifths. Flory Talbot, a blonde, feeble, goose-fat whore, in a tattered demalion gown of mildewed strawberry, lolls spread-eagle on the sofa corner, her limp forearm pendant over the bolster, listening. A heavy sty droops over her sleepy eyelid. Kitty hiccups again with a kick of her horsed foot. Oh, excuse. Zoe promptly. Your boy is thinking of you. Tie a knot on your shift. Kitty Ricketts bends her head. Her boa uncoils, slides, glides over her shoulder, back, arm, chair, to the ground. Lynch lifts the curled caterpillar on his wand. She snakes her neck, nestling. Stephen glances behind at the squatted figure with its cap back to the front. Stephen. As a matter of fact, it is of no importance whether Benedetto Marcello found it or made it. The right is the poet's rest. It may be an old hymn to Demeter, or also illustrate Coella and Arant Glorium Domini. It is susceptible of nodes, or modes, as far apart as Hyperphrygian and Mixolydian, and of texts so divergent as priests high hooping round David's, that is, Circe's, or what am I saying, Circe's altar and David's tip from the stable to his chief bassoonist about the all-rightness of his almightiness. Manon de non, that is another pair of trousers. Je te la gomme, faut que je ne sais pas. He stops, points at Lynch's cap, smiles, laughs. <laughs> Which side is your knowledge bump? The cap with saturnine spleen. Bah! It is because it is. Woman's reason. Jew Greek is Greek Jew. Extremes meet. Death is the highest form of life. Bah! Stephen. You remember fairly accurately all my errors, boasts, mistakes. <laughs> How long shall I continue to close my eyes to disloyalty? Whetstone. The cap. Bah! Stephen. Here's another for you. He frowns. The reason is because the fundamental and the dominant are separated by the greatest possible interval, which... The cap. Which... Finish. You can't. Stephen, with an effort. Interval which... is the greatest possible ellipse consistent with... The ultimate return, the octave, which... The cap. Which... Outside the gramophone begins to blare, The Holy City. Stephen, abruptly. 
what went forth to the ends of the world to transverse not itself god the sun shakespeare a commercial traveller having itself uh, traversed in reality itself becomes that self wait a moment wait a second damn that fellow's noise in the street <sighs> self which itself was ineluctably preconditioned to become echo lynch with a mocking whinny of laughter grins at bloom and zoe higgins what a learned speech eh zoe briskly god help your head he knows more than you have forgotten with obese stupidity flory talbot regards stephen flory they say the last day is coming this summer kitty no Zoe explodes in laughter. Great unjust God! Flory offended. Well, it was in the papers about Antichrist. Oh, my foot's tickling. Ragged barefoot newsboys, jogging a wagtail kite, patter past, yelling. The newsboys. Stop press sedition! Result from the rocking horse races! Sea serpent in the royal canal! Safe arrival of Antichrist. Stephen turns and sees Bloom. Stephen. A time, times, and half a time. Reuben I. Antichrist, wandering Jew, a clutching hand open on his spine, stumps forward. Across his loins is slung a pilgrim's wallet from which protrude promissory notes and dishonored bills. Aloft over his shoulder he bears a long boat-pole, from the hook of which the sodden, huddled mass of his only son, saved from liffy waters, hangs from the slack of its breeches. A hobgoblin in the image of Punch Costello, hip-shot, crook-backed, hydrocephalic, prognathic with receding forehead, and alley-sloper nose, tumbles in somersaults through the gathering darkness. All. What? The hobgoblin, his jaws chattering, capers to and fro, goggling his eyes, squeaking, kangaroo hopping with outstretched clutching arms, then all at once thrusts his lipless face through the fork of his thighs. Il vient, c'est moi, l'homme qui rit, l'homme primogène. He whirls round and round with dervish howls. Sieurs et dames, faites vos jeux. He crouches, juggling. Tiny roulette planets fly from his hands. Les jus sont faits. The planets rush together, uttering crepitant cracks. Rien va plus. The planets, buoyant balloons, sail swollen up and away. He springs off into vacuum. Flory, sinking into torpor, crossing herself secretly. The end of the world. A female tepid effluvium leaks out from her. Nebulous obscurity occupies space. Through the drifting fog without, the gramophone blares over coughs and feet shuffling. The gramophone. Jerusalem, open your gates and sing. Hosanna. A rocket rushes up the sky and bursts. A white star falls from it, proclaiming the consummation of all things and second coming of Elijah. Along an infinite, invisible tightrope, taut from zenith to nadir, the end of the world, a two-headed octopus in gillies kilts, busby and tartan filibegs, whirls through the murk, head over heels, in the form of the three legs of man. The end of the world, with a Scotch accent. He'll dance the keel row, the keel row, the keel row. Over the passing drift and choking breath coughs, Elijah's voice, harsh as a corn cake's, jars on high. Perspiring in a loose lawn surplice, with funnel sleeves, he is seen, verger faced, above a rostrum about which the banner of old glory is draped. He thumps the parapet. End of Ulysses 15C Read by Anita Roy Dobbs in Boston, June 2007